Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you this morning. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. How are you today? Doing well, doing well. Have a nice weekend. I noticed uh, some people were writing on Twitter giving you some congratulations. And, uh, yeah, I wonder why they keep reminding me about that stuff. <laughs> I know. I don't like it either for me. Yeah. So, it was nice know, to see there was a lot of really heartfelt, nice greetings, you know, yeah, out there. And, uh, I did get to see on those. <laughs> I see them. We had we had mainly family. It was it was a more quiet birthday because over the years we uh, we took license on that, or some people in the campaigns took yeah, license on that. They, that's true. They said you're going to have a big party. I said, well, I'm not into this stuff. <laughs> so it's it was uh, it's sort of the parties I've had in later years sort of made up for the early years, even though in the early years I didn't know it. But we never had a party <laughs> because it was I, I was born in the middle of the thirties. And then there was the, the World War II and family was in the military. Yeah. And it wasn't our tradition except the immediate family. Uh -huh. But now ours is immediate, but a little bit more. <laughs> a little bit and more. So we, have, we <laughs> usually have uh, big, uh, big parties on birthday. <laughs> but anyway, we had a good time. That's Smaller great. group, but we had a good time. And uh, I wish the country would do better. Yeah, though. yeah. And, you know, there are days when we, we can find the positive things and you see people expressing themselves and you see, well, you know, you know, that the, the, the uh, Trump people uh, are, are going to push some of those weirdos out. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there'll be a shift in attitude. Then the next thing they say, you know, it might not work, well, you know. No, nobody seems to be ready for that. So there's a lot of argument, but but we like polls to try to help figure us out. Yeah. Well, is is there going to be a real change? I, I all I know is if they, let's say that the Republicans narrowly hold the House yeah. and they don't uh, they don't change the Senate. I think that would be bad news, uh, not only for the country, but bad, bad news for, you know, if you can't beat the Democrats yeah. now, who are you going to beat? Yeah. But, of course, long term, we're never convinced that even if there is a, uh, a major changeover and Republicans and Democrats, uh, when they have a lot. I was, I was there for, I, I don't know whether it was two or four years, where the Republicans had the House and the Senate and the President with, when, when Bush was in. But believe me, there was a lot of spending and a lot of oh, wars yeah. going on yeah. there. So it, it was not the, the best of times when those Republicans had total control. So uh, a mixed control sometimes doesn't hurt us. You know, yeah. it's a little bit slow them up. But it doesn't seem to slow them up. What's happened now, you don't need the Congress. The Congress either acts on their own, yeah. courts write laws, there's a bureaucracy out there, and uh, it must be the most important position. When, when the other day we talked about how much how much money Fauci made, so that must be that must be a really important uh, you know part of the government, and uh, he must be a very important person. Yeah. The, 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 the the person that makes the most money in the hall of the government. Anyway, let's see what uh, poll we find. The poll uh, is reported by Daily Mail, but it was also an NBC poll. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So. We can uh, that caught our attention, and uh, the title, 75% of Americans think the U.S. is headed in the wrong direction. Well, we're not surprised. I don't think you uh, have to have spent too much money uh, on a poll to come to that conclusion. Uh, but uh, it's, um, it's some, people, some people think there's, a, you, you know, there's not been any positive change, uh, and... Uh, and the negatives are bad. That, that, I don't know how the Democrats could get any cheer out of this, yeah. but I don't think uh, Republicans should lay, lay back and say, you know, the Democrats are so bad, yeah. the, the American people are going to wake up, you yeah. know. But uh, if they're really, if they really wake up, what they'll say is, we we can't trust uh, both parties to do what they say because uh, that's generally been the case for decades, if not ever since government existed. Yeah, let's put up that first. This is from the Daily Mail, as you, as you mentioned, Dr. Paul. Uh, se nearly 75% of Americans think the U.S. is heading in the wrong direction under Biden. More than half worry that the country's best years are in the past. It reminds me of the Jimmy Carter era, you know, the Malays speech and that whole thing. Um, it's a NBC News poll, and they used Heart Associates. Uh, I think you mentioned that you've, you've, you're familiar with them. So it's a reputable firm. Let's look at that next one. Here's some of the uh, more details about it. 58% feel more worried that America's best years may already be behind us. 
Only 35% thinking the best years are yet to come. 68% of the respondents believe the U.S. is already in recession, despite Biden's attestations that the economy is rebounding after the country's <coughs> inflation rate hit a 40-year high. In total, the poll found 55% of Americans not disapprove of the job he's doing. And, and you're right, they seem to be attacking this, just attacking the language. Don't pay any attention to what it looks like in your bank account. We're not in, an infl- in a recession because we changed the definition of recessions. You know, we must be in 1984 because <laughs> yeah. they can change the definition of words. You know, they, they had to do a poll to find out that six, 68% of the people believe we're in a recession. And our government tells them there is no recession. <laughs> so don't, don't you believe the government? No, they don't believe the government. That's good because maybe they will uh, look for the truth and seek the truth and work in that direction. But but no, they, they just changed the definition. And, and that, that has been going on for years. I mean, uh, we, we've reported so often on when you measure inflation of the money supply and what it does, like raise prices of goods and services, they measure things like, uh, uh, you, you know, the CPI and PPI. And, uh, and, and they, they never report things accurately. Yeah. You know, it's always, it's always a fudge to make it, the, the administration not look quite as bad as they really are. So they, they, they fudge the figures, and then they come up with, uh, with, well, why don't we just take out food and energy and see, oh, yeah, things don't look quite so bad. Yeah. <laughs> food and energy. Do you think there's some people that food and energy... Uh, what if they're what if they're in a job they have to drive their car yeah and and they have kids and, and they like to them. eat <laughs> i mean i would i would say their inflation rate might be you know the biggest in the world and you know everybody else government says oh eight percent nine percent maybe and uh but now our job it's always been for years and years they wanted two percent inflation they finally got that but it went by so fast nobody recorded it and now guess what the goal is Two percent inflation. Yeah, they, we have to create a bad economy. We have to have a deliberate recession, and they believe that that it's uh, uh, the the way you you, you get rid of uh, inflation. Like inflation fell out of the sky, yeah. and what you need is a depression or a recession, and that'll push prices down. It's it's totally nuts, and uh, because they won't deal with a real subject of where does all this distortion come from high prices and and tense cities and and all the all the arguments going on and the hatred of the world and uh, it, it comes from too much government spending and uh, and an outfit there that says well monopoly was a great game uh, and they still play it they use monopoly money and they pass yeah. it out and some people haven't recognized <laughs> yet that it's monopoly money <laughs> when they decide this is monopoly money things are going to really change that's when you're going to see some fireworks well you you make a great point that it really is the republicans to lose judging from the mood of the country based on these numbers but i think you probably would also say they're probably going to do a pretty good job of trying to lose it (laughs) because you could ask what do they stand for well you know fiscal restraint no we don't see much of that and we haven't seen much of that well surely they're going to maybe oppose biden's warmongering no 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 they're actually attacking we'll talk about this in the second segment, they're attacking him in the very few areas where he actually makes some sense in foreign policy because he's not warmongering enough. And, you know, McConnell, the, the minority leader in the Senate, he's sort of already bracing people for not a great result in the Senate. And he said he was just grumbling, well, the quality of the candidates is not very high. We may not make it, you know, which he means he means the Trump supporters that are that are now running. Oh, that's, doing well. dri- that's, that's just driving him nuts. Yeah. But uh, they had a test run on that on on Trump. And, yeah. And I, I think yeah, I think that candidate's name was Cheney or something yeah. like that. And she didn't do so well. So that's probably what is driving the, the Democrats nuts right now. But even that is not that's that, that's sort of an exception of what's going on, but uh, the, the vote in the fall will see how many people agreed with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, yeah. Well, here's, let's, let, the, the article from the Daily Mail had some great graphs, so we're going to go ahead and use them, and let's put up a couple of these, because it's always good to just get a visual of it. Is the United States headed in the right direction? That's that little tiny green one. Headed in the wrong direction? That's that massive red 74%. Next one, do you approve of Joe Biden's job in office, that smaller green one of 42% approved, that larger red of 55% 
disapprove of his job in office. The next one is the economy, probably the most important. 40% approve and 56% disapprove of how he's handling the economy. And now the next one as we move down, is the U.S. in recession? As we talked about, they tried to change the name of it. They did everything they could. It didn't convince the American people. 68% believe we're in a recession, while 27% don't believe so. Those are the people. I don't know who they are. Um, here's the next one is CPI from 81 to, two, to 2022. And you can see that massive, massive jump. June 2022, 10-year high of 40-year high of 9.1%. So with those numbers in, with that in inflation numbers in, that last question that we'll put up here is how will Inflation Reduction Act affect your life? People are not super enthusiastic. 36% said it's not going to make a difference. 35% is going to make it worse. Only 26% said it'll make things better. So people don't have any faith in the Inflation Reduction Act. They don't have any faith in the economy, uh, they're, they're pretty disillusioned, I think. Well, yeah, and then the number 35, a third of the people say it's going to make it worse. Yeah. So, so you have two thirds, uh, you know, have no idea what's yeah. going to go on. Uh, so is it no, nobody really, well, a few people are saying yeah, that, yes, it's going to help, but that has to be a, a daydream to yeah. think that, said that doing more of the same thing over and over again uh, at uh, printing money and spending money and running the world and having having a uh, empire to deal with and a welfare state to deal with and and no hesitation whatsoever. So they come up with these stories. Well, under modern monetary theory, it's not necessary to do that. And under Keynesian economics, they say deficits aren't that bad. Matter of fact, the weaker the economy, the bigger the deficit should be. You know, and on and on with this nonsense. But you know, because People want to believe because they say, well, I've d I did pretty well. Even people, if they cut off the last two years before uh, COVID invaded, mm -hmm. that people would say, well, you know, the last 10 years, I've, I've been doing pretty well. And, and there have been periods they do when, when people aren't getting the payment. The payment comes due. And it's, and, but when they're just printing the money and passing it out, there's, people do pretty well but it's all fake it's yeah. like i always tell people it's like oh daniel let's start a new business here and i know a banker down here he he can loan us a million dollars a month for six months and we get it it went going and uh, oh oh there then then we uh, spend it but we also spend it on ourselves <laughs> we, we feel very well but then the bank yeah. calls an end to it and the, and the bank in this case is the marketplace because the because, uh, you know, the system has to reassure them that the money will always come. So when this extra little thing came about called COVID on top of what the Fed was doing, what was the first thing they do? They, they started this thing where they ended up passing out $6 trillion. Yeah. And they, they wonder why we're in trouble. And we haven't even touched, uh, you know, the transition from that money sitting there and assimilating and getting into the economy and having prices discounted that it's just starting it's sort of like a brush fire no other brush fire started on the edges but all of a sudden the the fire is going to uh, the fire has been lit pretty soon it's going to be huge yeah and when you dig down to how the american family feels um here's something from the from the article in the daily mail uh, moody's analytics economist mark zandy studying the latest U.S. government price data, he has determined that households are now spending nearly $493 more each month to buy the same items they were buying a year ago. And I'm sorry, that really does add up an extra 500 bucks a month just to get what you were getting a year ago. It's no surprise at all then that people are feeling like the best days are behind them. Yeah, and, and this whole thing about jobs and the job numbers, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions there. And some people, uh, you know, have one job and they're suffering from the things you just described and, and they still can't live with it. 
So they're taking two jobs. Yeah. And, uh, and that goes in. Instead of that looking like a negative, they look as a positive. Oh, we just created a million new jobs because people were suffering so badly. They have to work from uh, 9 to 5 and then 6 to 12, you know, in order to feed their family. Yeah. You know, so the, the, and the government statistics aren't very helpful. Uh, the, the people who are honest, they, they work and they pay their bills, and they have to go to the store, and they understand what's going on. And they're, they're, they don't represent what's happening in Washington. Yeah. Well, let's move to our next topic, if you're ready, Dr. Paul. And let's skip those next two clips and just move on to the Gatestone. Um, and we, this is via Zero Hedge, so we give them the credit for putting this up. But, um, but so this, I think this is an example. This came out today. Biden drops more crucial demands to get Iran deal. Now, Gatestone is a basically a neocon outfit. But I, I think, you know, we wanted to talk about this a little bit because here's a preview of the neocon pushback. If Biden is actually successful in doing one of the things that we think is a pretty good thing, which is going back to the Iran deal. We, I remember you praised uh, the Obama era for two good things, easing up on Cuba and making a deal with Iran even though you didn't think we needed a deal because we should never have sanctions in the first place, at the very least, moving toward peace and away from confrontation was good. And then, of course, Trump came in and surrounded himself with neocons and got us out of it. So Biden is trying to get us back in. Uh, and I think he's sincere for the most part, but he's got a lot of pressure. And here's the kind of pushback that he's going to be getting as we get very close to the New Deal. You know, I've often said that uh, many people in the Middle East never forget and Americans never remember. <laughs> and uh, I don't think many Americans remember 1953. I remember Bill O'Reilly n never heard of a problem in 1953 <laughs> when I brought the subject up. And uh, well, of course, what I was talking about was the coup. You know, we're, we're against coups, you know, that's nasty stuff. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and D Donald Trump was on the verge of an insurrection and a total takeover of the government and have a, this, this huge coup. Now, there was a real coup that the uh, British and the Americans got together in 1950, which started all this stuff. You know, that's why if we would have followed the principle of a non-intervention's foreign policy, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been in there and stealing the oil is what happened. But uh, it didn't work. Uh, you know, they ended up, uh, uh, you know, responding by becoming more estranged from the world and uh, more protective and it didn't help America and it didn't help uh, the people there and now they, they, we've been fighting er ever since. So yes, moving in the directions with it, just an agreement on that because uh, I think the evidence, uh, I, I, I think the Iranians would, you know, under certain conditions would like and have probably done their research on if, if they ever got hit by a nuclear weapon, can they retaliate? But I really do believe that the, the inspections had some reality there and that, uh, that they were more interested in uh, denuclearizing that area. But right now, this, this thing, uh, you know, it's not going to be smooth, even with uh, even with the concessions of, of Biden. Yeah. Uh, it uh, it is going to be used by by the hawks. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and you know, one thing uh, I when figuring this stuff out, I realized that there are hawks on both sides. Yes. You know, you might have you might have somebody even in the Soviet system or yeah. the, now the Russian system that you might have a, a, a leader that might be more sympathetic than it appears, but it might be that there's a, a military co complex in, in, the, in Russia and, and to, to maintain public support, they go along with that. But that's, uh, that, is, that is a big problem, and that, that's why uh, the case for a peaceful society uh, should be made <laughs> a little bit stronger or more influential that we can get people to agree that we don't need wars. Wars don't cause prosperity. It, it, I think there was a Republican president in recent years that said, you know, all great prayer presidents have to take care of a war. Yeah. And we had a war. Uh, for, fortunately, there was no rewards for that uh, for him. Well, reportedly, the U.S. has signed off on this new agreement, which basically is a return to the old agreement. And the neocons are mad because they wanted a bunch of new conditions to be brought to the table, you know, reduction in their ballistic missiles. Well, this wasn't part of the original deal, and there's no way that Iran, once it got a deal, would, it, would make more concessions. There's no advantage to it. 
but uh, and this is according to an antiwar.com article. Um, he points out that Matt Lee, who's the AP diplomatic reporter, he's reporting that members of Congress are capitalizing on the alleged plot to assassinate John Bolton and the attack on Salman Rushdie to prevent a return to the agreement. To that, I would say it's rather suspicious that these two things come out right at a time when you're just about to return to this. And you know, I don't have any information about it, but A, Bolton was involved in assassinations in Iran, you know, uh, the um, Soleimani assassination and others. The Rushdie thing, I don't know anything about it. Supposedly the guy's pro-Iran, but we know for sure that the neocons are blaming Iran. It's a convenient excuse to say this. And of course, Ted Cruz, who always loves to be the armchair general, he said the Ayatollahs have been trying to murder Salman Rushdie for decades. The Biden administration must finally cease appeasing the Iranian regime. So that's, that's the mindset of a neocon. If we want to return to trade, if we want to move away from conflict and war, they call that appeasement. You know, they always use that term. Yes, and, and this, this is uh, something that you, is used politically, and it's very powerful because if you take a position uh, that is working for peace, uh, they will put this in terms of, you know, the way they, they attacked me was, oh, unpatriot, and yeah. unpa- unpatriotic, and you don't support the troops, and you're weak, and, uh, and here it turns out that uh, maybe that the opposite is true. <laughs> maybe people who are insecure do not have confidence in what liberty is all about, do not understand economic policy, but they are influenced by profiteering by, by, by weapons manufacturers, yeah. and that's, that's been around for uh, more than you know, the last 10 or 15 years. That's been around for a long time. Well, the one thing that the hawks here in the U.S., they're not even hawks, they're just neocons, what they don't understand is this is a different world than it was when the U.S. originally entered into the agreement with Iran. The world has changed significantly, particularly in the last six months, with the U.S. sanctions driving Iran and Russia closer together, Iran and China closer together. The, Iran is no longer as dependent on trade with Europe and the U.S. And in fact, Europe is poor. They can't buy anything anyway, right? <laughs> so, and here's just a couple of examples I dug up to... to, to describe how the world has changed and it's not as, I would argue, it's not as urgent for Iran to come back to this U.S. and E.U. deal. Let's look up the next one. This is significant, I think. The United Arab Emirates has sent an ambassador to Iran the first time in six years. They broke relations six years ago. Now they're sending back an ambassador. Iran is slowly making peace with the Arab states in the Gulf. And that is a significant thing. The second one, if we can go to this, Iran says U.S. dollar officially ditched in trade with ally Russia. So the U.S. did the nuclear option, kicked Russia out of SWIFT, said you can't use our dollars to trade anymore. And Russia and Iran said, okay, we'll use something else, you know. (laughs) So this is an own goal. This is a shot in the head. And here's the next one. Iran oil exports could rise further after June, July increase, trackers say they had a huge increase in their exports. They're sending it to China. They're sending it to India. They're sending it elsewhere. They no longer have to rely on these markets. Uh, you know, unintentional consequences of the sanctions against Russia have changed the world, I think. And so I would just argue, Dr. Paul, that the world is different now. We no longer have the clout to sit down and bang on the table. That's, that's, that's true. And nobody really predicted it. But I think the general statement that if you trade with people, things go better and both sides benefit. But, you know, one, one thing that has always annoyed me, and I don't know where we stand on frozen assets, but that's always been a thorn in the side of the Iranians because we uh, f- froze billions of dollars. And then uh, I think Obama actually sent some back, and that was interpreted as the taxpayers paying yeah. money to the Iranians and all it was was oh, money no. we stole from them and <laughs> you know and and that goes on right now I wonder if we would uh, uh, you know ever pay rent uh, for the oil that we're getting out of Syria right now just think of think of how how we, we work that deal I mean uh, 
that that's probably not settled forever yeah, in, in yeah. Syria. But we're we're getting a lot of oil because we maintain the oil up there. So that that's a cost, and and also a reason because we're involved in that. There's less likely, and there's there's not as as much motivation, you, you know, for a more peaceful uh, agreement where. Uh, right, right now uh, it's up for grabs, and boy, I think that's a hot spot over yeah. there. And it's 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 not any better since we've been involved, but we're not really involved. <laughs> I mean, we our troops aren't over there. We just send advisors and weapons and monies <laughs> and bribes and and uh, the the whole works. Well, we're just flat out stealing Syria's oil. I mean, we uh, basically you can see the trucks coming. But I think there are some changes there. Maybe we'll talk about those later this week. There are some changes there, I think, with Erdogan turning around a little bit uh, and the increasing ties between the Turkish and Syrian governments. I think, you know, there's, uh, there's going to be a switch there. But let's, um, I'm going to close out if we're, we're ready. I just want to remind, less than two weeks, people, less than two weeks, put up the next clip. Anatomy of a Police State, September 3rd, 2022, Weston, Washington Dulles Airport. Go to rompaulinstitute.org to get your tickets. Now's the time to get those tickets before they sell out. It's going to be a great get-together, a lot of great speakers, a lot of great people, and a good time. This will be our sixth conference, as we mentioned, in D.C. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a little nervous because there's a lot to do, but I'll tell you what, I'm really looking forward to it, Dr. Paul. You know, all police states start not by s announcing to the people who want the police state and saying, you know, uh, th th this, is, uh, this is something that's very good. We're going to give you a police state. But what they do is they start by telling them, we're going to take care of you. We're going to protect you. And there's an enemy out there, and you have to sacrifice your li liberties. And that, that came up certainly after 9-11. Uh, and you were, I think, in the office by that time where people would call in and say, yes, that's right. And Dr. Paul may be right on this thing. But you have to do one thing. When you need to be safe and secure, you have to sacrifice a certain amount of your freedoms. And you know that certain amount, whether it's 1% or 10%, is the amount that sells you out. And that's like the people who argued the case correctly way back in 1913, that assuming that you can tax the income of every person means you own that person, you own their income. And uh, they, they uh, then, then say that it'll get worse. And it, and it does get worse. Even now, well, yeah, but once it was up to 90%, now it's much down. But the taxation is a little more sophisticated now. So the principle of taxation is still very bad because uh, they, they tax by stealing the money from your account by diluting the value of your account. And, and that's theft, too. But the, it's so rarely seen as a moral issue. And, and it's always seen as, a, well, we have to take care of the poor, the sick, the people who are hungry. Oh, uh, yes, we'll build them tent cities. They like to live in tents. We'll put them up, we'll give them a couple more tents to put up. So it is tragic that that, that is the, the case. But we are going to keep plugging away at uh, pointing out what happens when you concede a little bit, you end up with a big police state, and that's what we have. And uh, when, when you think of the uh, FBI right now, uh, I think they, they, might, they might qualify as an arm of the police state. And there's a lot of policemen up there, you know, and I've been talking about that for years. I, I think when I first thought, talked about it, I said, bureaucrats shouldn't exist. We shouldn't have a national police force, but we're gonna almost have 100,000 of them, and they're allowed to carry guns. But now I understand it's 200,000, and they're out recruiting 87,000. And the, one of the advertising uh, t temptation is we want you to be able to uh, shoot a gun, you know. So it, it is a police state, and it's, it's not a police state for you if you do exactly what they tell you. But uh, you are being policed and you are a prisoner and you don't live in a free society. If the only way you can survive is being obedient to the police state, and, and, and that is a tough question to answer because sometimes it's either suicide to, uh, uh, to, to resist. But we do not have to uh, ignore the fact of what they're doing. They need to be named and the people need to know what the alternative is and they need to understand. 
take take a thing like uh, uh, you know protectionism that is so tempting uh, to to endorse protectionism, but people need to know about it. And you know, 20 years ago, you couldn't find an economist in this country that said, "Oh, I'm a protectionist." I'm a. But now, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, if you don't keep the tariffs on and and the punishment, then then uh, then you're then you need to be out of office. They believe in all this protectionism and all this authoritarianism. It is the principle of authoritarianism versus voluntarism that is the principle that is the principle we have to deal with, because a voluntary society is one where people change things by peacefully negotiating and setting examples for other countries should do it individuals should do it and we have less and less of that every time i hope we can contribute to the solution of that argument in our conference next week thank you very much for tuning in today to the liberty report come back soon